Hi everyone, we're just going to give it a couple of minutes just for people to come into this session. So please bear with us for another minute. Thank you very much. Great, I think we should get started. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. It is my delight to welcome you all to this webinar, uh, The Pandemic is Gendered, Exploring the Impact of COVID-19 on Women in Bangladesh, Kenya and Nigeria. So just a couple of pieces of housekeeping to begin with. Um, first of all, this is being recorded. So just so you know, if you contribute, it will be recorded. The second thing to say is that if any of you have um, if you really want to follow the live transcript, this should, will be available at the bottom of your screen. You just have to uh, activate it by clicking the live transcript button on the bottom right hand corner of your Zoom screen. And finally, if you want to ask any questions throughout the presentation, we really encourage it. Please do so using the Q&A function. I'm sure you're all dab hands of it right now, um, but just that, that's what we're going to be doing. So just to give you a bit of an introduction to what we're doing here today. This, uh, this webinar today is presenting some preliminary findings from our COVID-19 and gender research project that we're currently launching, or currently working on, which is understanding and mitigating the real-time differential gendered effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Looking at this in nine different countries, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Kenya, DRC, Brazil, Canada, UK, China, and Hong Kong, generously funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Canadian Institute for Health Research. We'd be delighted if any of you wanted to read more about our, our research and our ongoing efforts uh, on the link uh, on the screen attached now. As part of this project, we also convene the Gender Working Group, which is now a, um, a group of over 600 participants from across academia, practitioners, policy makers, and everything in between. We meet online on the third Wednesday of every month to discuss key issues, have presentations of different people research, think about ideas for collaboration going forward. So again, everybody is welcome to join this and please do get in touch with us should you wish to take part. Just to highlight some other things that have come out recently, we recently published the gender or how to create a gender responsive pandemic plan led by our fabulous colleague Rosemary Morgan who's also brought together this uh, webinar for us today. Uh, this is giving a uh, key policy guidance, applied guidance of how to really gender mainstream pandemic preparedness plans going forward. And coming soon, we're going to have policy outputs on COVID-19 vac COVID vaccines and vaccinations from a gender perspective, particularly using some data we've got from Brazil and looking at a policy brief, looking at how Nigeria is responding from a gender perspective. So we encourage you all to look at these pieces and of course we will share them with you in due course. So on to today's seminar, uh, webinar. We have an amazing panel for you of our team from across the world. We're going to start with Dr. Tina Rabani, who's an associate scientist at the Brack James uh, P. Grant School of Public Health and an associate professor of the Department of Economics at Dhaka University. Following on, we're going to have Salima Kabir, who is an assistant research coordinator at the Brack James P. Grant School of Public Health at Brack University. We're then going to move from Bangladesh to Kenya to have uh, insights from the Kenyan case study from Anne in, in Nungiri, a senior technical advisor from LVCT Health before taking reflections from our colleague in Nigeria, Amy oye Kinley, an agenda consultant in Nigeria. After we've had the presentations of each of our findings so far and the initial findings from our research, we are honored to be joined today by two discussants, Dr. Ayula and Dr. Mofijul, who are going to add some reflections from the policy landscape of both Bangladesh and Nigeria to understand where our data where our findings are fitting in to how policymakers are thinking about these issues. So without further ado, 
I am going to say thank you all for being here today. Uh, please do not be alarmed if our colleague uh, Bao uh, Muller is going to interrupt. She's keep timekeeping for us today, so if you suddenly see her pop up, that is what's happening. Uh, and please, and then at the end of the day, at the end of the session, we're going to have time, plenty of time for all your questions and considerations. I will hand over right now to um, Atunu. Thank you. Let me get my slides up first. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to share some results from uh, mobile phone surveys uh, that we have carried out in three countries, Bangladesh, Kenya, and Nigeria. Um, as, as part of this uh, larger project. Uh, so but I think uh, needless to say for this audience, uh, this COVID-19 pandemic has been quite disruptive and uh, it has not been uh, gender neutral. Um, so this is a figure not from our data, but a World Bank report just recently came out, uh, which, has, uh, uh, which shows that women are more likely to lose jobs uh, during pandemic. I think except for two countries, one is actually in our sample, Nigeria and Philippine. In all other countries, uh, uh, women lost more, more likely to lose jobs compared to men. Um, it is related to the worst mental health outcome, uh, especially for uh, women and uh, many other socially excluded groups. Um, uh, there's also reports of higher gender-based violence as well as child marriages, uh, particularly in Bangladesh, uh, countries like Bangladesh where there are sustained school closures. Uh, this, is, uh, this has emerged as a very kind of uh, more acute uh, crisis. Uh, even for vaccine uptakes, uh, we have um, uh, we can we have seen that uh, there are gender gaps, and not only in that margin, other margins as well. Uh, and that's something that we will talk about uh, uh, today. So our um, we have uh, uh, initially we uh, decided to have three rounds of survey, two of which we have already uh, we are already finished with. In Kenya and Nigeria, the sample came from random uh, digit dial, and you can all already see the number of um, um, participants in our surveys. In Bangladesh, uh, we took advantage of a national representative survey, national um, nutrition survey, and we drew sample from that. Uh, we additionally included sample weights uh, to ensure that uh, we could uh, make the analysis as much nationally representative as possible. We also carried out a one, two, one small module in Kenya and Bangladesh uh, to uh, the spouses of the respondents, but we are not going to show any result today from that uh, additional small survey. That was done in only in round one. So I'm going to show you five uh, different, different set of results. So first one, uh, I'll show you some food security uh results um uh, so you can see that in nigeria and kenya food security or insecurity was much higher compared to bangladesh there is a gender gap in terms of reporting of this uh, food insecurity uh, in kenya is uh, the point estimates are particularly large um they're statistically uh, not significantly different from each other but the point estimates and the direction generally show that women are more likely to report food insecurity of the households. Then we can, I, I'll show you some results from the time use uh, because there is a concern that women end up uh, bearing much larger share of the household burden uh, in terms of, uh, for example, in our case, uh, if, you, if you just focus on the time use for child care, whether it increased or not, it increased both for men and women, but it is much larger for uh, women. And not only that, uh, the difference is statistically significant across all three countries. Uh, 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 both men and women are likely to say that this increase is unfair. We don't find a statistically significant difference between by gender, but it's interesting to see that uh, um, uh, there's a general grievance uh, uh, in terms of taking care of um, or, or the change in uh, time use uh, uh, because of the pandemic. 
Third thing, uh, I'll focus on the mental health. Um, in all three countries, we collected uh, using the mental health well-being data using uh, a shorter version of PHQ and GAD2. These are basically measure of uh, depression and anxiety. Uh, it's interesting to see that in Kenya and Nigeria, uh, between round one and round two, so that is between November uh, 2020 and March 2021, um, uh, the mental health uh, worsened, higher score means uh, worse uh, psychological well being uh, in Kenya and Nigeria. In Bangladesh, it actually improved. Uh, there, in Bangladesh, I, since I know about the context, this was between the two surges, so things were kind of coming back to normalcy, so it's, uh, it makes sense. Um, I think it would be nice to know from um, uh, our speaker from Nigeria and Kenya to put some context uh, for these uh, findings. We can also stratify by gender and both uh, in Nigeria and Kenya, we find that uh, it increased the psychological uh, well-being uh, decline more for women compared to men. Uh, there was no difference in round one in, uh, for, uh, in Kenya, but it kind of diverged. There was a gap uh, uh, in Nigeria in round one in no November 2020, but uh, those two kind of converge uh, by round two. In Bangladesh, uh, uh, we see the overall decline uh, in the score that is uh, improvement in uh, mental health uh, between the two rounds. Uh, we are also interested to understand uh, um, mask wearing in particular, uh, because non-pharmaceutical intervention remain very relevant, especially given the vaccine deployment and uh, access have been quite uneven across countries. Um, we ask a direct question as well as elicited uh, uh, because we were we worried uh, uh, we were worried that. Uh, the direct question may, be, may, be, may suffer from social desirability bias. And this is actually evident. So for example, the elicited one, we can, if we focus just on that one, uh, majority of the respondent uh, uh, did not uh, wear mask regularly whenever they were out um, in, 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 out in the, um, uh, interacted outside household with other people. Uh, so, and the numbers are quite uh, in the similar ballpark. Uh, ballpark. Uh, it's highest in Bangladesh. Fifty-eight percent of the respondents say that they don't didn't wear masks. It's lowest in Kenya, but all are uh, kind of in the fifties uh, at, at different levels. Uh, we also can look at it by different uh, by by gender. Um, uh, in Nigeria, I think the point estimates are most relevant. There is a significant gap. Um, these differences are not statistically significant, but uh, the point estimates are quite still quite intriguing uh, that there's some difference and uh, especially in Nigeria, women are even less likely to wear masks compared to our male respondents. Last thing I'll talk about uh, is vaccine or uh, vaccine perceptions. So uh, we asked two questions about uh, vaccine hesitancy. Uh, first about the efficacy, the other one is about side effect. Uh, we see some difference between Kenya and Nigeria on one side and Bangladesh on the other side. In Bangladesh, people are less concerned, our respondents were less concerned about the adverse side effect. In Kenya and Nigeria, we find that uh, the, the people who respond, people who mentioned that they are very much concerned about the side effect. That group is much, percentage wise, much larger um, uh, in Kenya and Nigeria. So this is kind of interesting. And uh, um, uh, thank you. Um, and we also um, ask about perceived access. And uh, we find that um, uh, in, in Bangladesh, again, the perceived access, uh, whether they will be able to access the vaccines among the people who did not receive the vaccine is much higher. There's a much higher confidence in terms of accessing the vaccine. Um, in Kenya and Nigeria, the, even though the level is lower, the majority of the respondents mentioned that uh, they, they are confident that they will be able to access the vaccine over the next six months. Uh, lastly, I'll focus on just on Bangladesh about one result because in Bangladesh we have uh, had um, the vaccine deployment. Uh, so, but in, in second round, when we asked this question, uh, there has been already been a month since uh, the vaccine was uh, um, being distributed. 
and offered. And we find that regardless of what kind of model we run, what kind of variables we include, whether we or the machine, there's a little bit machine uh, learning algorithm going on, the odds of um, uh, odds for women receiving the vaccine is much lower. It's kind of straightforward, about uh, 48 percentage, uh, 48 uh, percent lower for women compared to men. Uh, so uh, vaccine access has been quite um unequal and uneven and i think that there are many impediments uh, uh, women on other social excluded uh, class face in terms of vaccine access and we need to explore those further in future uh, research to ensure that we have a more equitable and uh, morally acceptable access to vaccine so over to you here Thank you so much, Atunu. So I'm now going to pass over to listen to the qualitative findings which complement what Atunu has been talking about with Salima. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Salima. Uh, I'm, I've been coordinating the qualitative component for um, the Gender Covid Project in Bangladesh. And I'm just going to be talking everyone through uh, a few initial findings um, from the project. These are uh, not all of them because obviously we have some time constraints, but I hope you'll find them interesting. Uh, for the quality component, we relied primarily on um, in-depth interviews uh, conducted over the phone. We managed to do about um, 10 in the field before the situation worsened, so we had to um, revert back to phone interviews. Uh, we talked to 40 respondents in total. Of them, we've been following up with about 20 um, in order to get uh, access to longitudinal data because of, uh, to get a better sense of how their situation is changing as the situation in Bangladesh changes. Um, we've been speaking to a pretty diverse group of women, um, primarily women. Uh, we have healthcare workers, adolescent working mothers, garment workers, domestic workers, single and divorced women. Um, and we also had a cohort of about 10 men just to have some comparative data. Uh, the themes that came up are very similar to um, what was already presented in uh, the quant presentation, but I just wanted to highlight just how closely interlinked all of these different themes are. Um, so if your housework, if your burden of housework increases, that has an impact on your psychosocial well-being, which can have an impact on your social relationships, which can then even impact your food security because you may be reliant on borrowing food from your neighbors or family members. Um, and all of this is kind of in constant an environment of fear around COVID-19, which is not just the disease, but also the result in lockdown, surveillance due to uh, surveillance from police and army, et cetera. And we found that gender has just been cross-cutting through it all. It's very difficult to extricate gender from any of these themes. Um, just to give you a brief idea of what the situation has been like in Bangladesh, um, after our first case on March 8th, we had a national sh uh, shutdown for about three months, which was strongly enforced. We had very effective national messaging around uh, wearing masks, washing hands, maintaining distance. But it is important to remember that um, in a slum setting, uh, you, you may not have access to um, uh, direct access to water, it's erratic. Um, also, water is shared between multiple families, living conditions are very congested. And so um, you ultimately, it becomes very difficult to enforce these precautions, even if they are aware of it. Um, the informal sector in Bangladesh took the biggest hit when the lockdown took place with 87% of the workforce affected. Uh, currently, we're in partial lockdown with the full lockdown declared um, July 1st. Uh, what, during the first three months of the lockdown, there was a very strict enforcement, which resulted in people unable to go to work, loss of income, and even though stimulus packages were rolled out, it was very difficult to ensure equitable distribution. Um, and this resulted in reduced food consumption. We know from our first round of quantitative um, survey results that women were more likely to re report uh, food insecurity more than men. Um, and households that had a worse uh, uh, households that had greater food insecurity naturally was, uh, had poorer mental health scores on the um, scale that I has already described. Um, with all of that context in mind, I want to talk you through the story of Arifa, one of our respondents. She's only 23 years old, and she lives in um, a slum in Dhaka city with her husband and two children. So she used to be a garments worker, but after her first child was born, she opted to 
take a loan from Breck and launch, uh, sort of start her own little tea cell outside of her home because it was conveniently located. Uh, Aifa's husband is an informal worker, so his uh, income has always been a little bit erratic and um, unstable. Uh, and so they rely primarily on Aifa's income and earnings to get by. During the lockdown, uh, there was, they suffered a lot of losses, primarily because uh, she would sell her food and snacks and tea on credit. And uh, as customers were unable to pay her back, she lost a lot of money. Um, and without having too much savings to fall back on, Ali Arifa's family actually ended up eating the uh, food from her stall in order to sustain, but also to ensure that they don't go to waste. Um, now, it's, uh, what's interesting about Arifa's case is that her husband had an affair uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, he came back right before, after counseling from both their family members. But when he returned, Arifa felt a need to keep him happy. This is because a male guardian provides a lot of protection um, to vulnerable women, particularly in slums, in terms of not only harassment, but also uh, protection from gossip and rumors. Uh, so during lockdown, despite being pregnant, Aifa felt she had to keep her husband happy, and so she gave him larger portions of food. She justified it by saying he's a man, he needs to eat more, he works harder, he's been out all day trying to find work, I was just home doing housework, um, I don't need that much. And uh, she interestingly said that she's worried that if he's not well fed, he may go outside looking for food. And I think this speaks to anxieties around having another affair if he relies on others for food. Um, when we spoke to Arifa during our follow-ups post lockdown around May, her TSO was running again and her husband was still with her. So her condition was improving. Um, but Arifa's case sort of mirrors the case of many of our respondents. Uh, a lot of the household responsibilities ensuring people are fed, even if you have a husband at home, falls on the women um, and they have to balance both uh, earning an income with the household chores. Um, and as a result, the pandemic really increased their workload. We know from before that even pre-pandemic, women used to work, wake up early to get their housework completed before going out to work. But with the added precautions for COVID-19, plus their husband and children staying at home, their, their responsibilities increased, even doubled in some cases. Um, and those who um, were working, so in case of garment workers, garment workers were able to go back to work a little before lockdown was officially lifted. Um, during that time, overtime is an easy way for them to make a little bit extra money, especially to make back the money that they had lost during lockdown. Um, but women found it very scary and precarious to go back to work or stay longer for overtime because the roads were so empty and there were police on the streets. There was a fear of assault, rape, or mugging. Um, and this all led to reduced income and a lot of mental stress and anxiety. Um, all of this uh, and, uh, resulted in deaths accruing. So uh, most of our respondents mentioned that they uh, decided to take out some kind of a loan. The amount may vary, but almost everyone did take out a loan. Um, this is partly because their um, there was reduced fam uh, support from their community and family members. Typically, there's someone better off who can help you out during a crisis. But in this case, everyone was suffering the same. And so there was no one to really uh, fall back on or get help from. Um, and so there was a lot, of, um, <clears throat> a lot of concern around making ends meet, how to pay for rent, how to pay for food. Um, as Otto I mentioned, uh, uh, child marriage went up. So there were a lot of weddings to pay for as well, which is, uh, which uh, then has a lot of money involved. Um, and even when the lockdown was lifted and they were able to go back to work, the situation didn't entirely improve for them because they still have to save up a lot of money to ensure that they're able to pay back their debts. And this is contributing to a very, uh, a lot of stress and anxiety amongst most of our respondents. In terms of the vaccine, the rollout started um, in early January uh, properly from February, uh, but only 3% of our population has been vaccinated. Uh, we can ad attribute this to partially to the fact that there are some barriers to access. You do, need, you do need to have access to internet, a national ID card, um, your own phone number to receive confirmation texts um, in order to register for um, the vaccine. Uh, on top of this, uneducated found it difficult to register because you need to have a level of literacy to fill out the registration form. Um, there's also been a lot of uh, misinformation, or I would rather say lack of information around how to get vaccines. In fact, 41% um, of our respondents from the round two surveys told us that they don't know how to access the vaccine. This was greater for women, about 48% reported that they do not know how to get access the vaccine. 
Um, while the quant did speak to the fact that uh, Bangladeshis are less afraid of the side effects, um, it could speak to the time at which that interview was, uh, or the survey was conducted, because um, as the vaccine rollout sort of um, became more uh, prominent and people were more aware of it, uh, we got responses that it was sort of the vaccine rollout sort of aligned with the second wave. So we had respondents who said that um, after the vaccine rolled out, people were dying more. We also heard that um, people are still getting the vaccine even after, we're still getting uh, COVID even after getting the vaccine. And these are sort of um, detracting people from uh, being vaccinated. There's also a distrust of the government agenda. It's one of the few very rare instances where we're um, advocating for adults to get vaccinated. Primarily the vaccine drives are targeted towards children. So there's some concern there. Uh, there's also uh, this idea that um, there's no need for the vaccine in slums because uh, no one's dying in the slums. Corona is a rich person's disease. Um, and this all sort of speaks to a la national level sort of communication gap. And there needs to be a better messaging around um, registration and access to vaccines as we get access to the vaccines again, because obviously we're also right now functioning at a shortage. but. Um, I believe there are plans to uh, reopen that maybe in July. Uh, to speak to um, everything that was uh, that we've discussed, uh, we spoke to a diverse population of women, um, but the main concerns I feel like are prevalent. Regard, I mean, across classes, just sort of amplifies issues that already existed. Um, in addition to losing jobs uh, and staying at home, food prices were rising. They also had. Uh, other expenses to consider. This led to a cycle of debt, increased precarity, increased mental stress. Um, the response to COVID was very biomedical, and this didn't take into account the environment of the slums. So oftentimes, maybe they weren't able to carry out the precautions they needed to. The messaging around uh, both the disease and um, uh, the vaccines need to sort of take into account local understandings, really speak to what the local fears are, um, uh, instead of just targeting it towards the more educated population, we really need to consider uh, where the fears might be coming up for someone who isn't familiar with the vaccines are, how they work, what they do. Um, and finally, as the cases rise and you know there's a lockdown coming up, the situation is very likely to worsen for the poor and a new set of challenges may emerge. So you'll have to wait and see. Uh, thank you so much. I'm Salima and I really wanna thank my team um, for all the support that we've had. Thank you so much, Lima, for that really great um, summary of everything you've been doing so far. Okay, without further ado, I'm going to suggest we go over to Anne to talk about the Kenya findings. Um, Claire, if you could confirm it's visible from your end, please. Yep, perfect. Right. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for this opportunity. Good morning, good afternoon from wherever you're joining from. Um, mine will be to present the preliminary findings from the Kenya qualitative study that we did. Um, the presentation will focus on the methodology, the process that we took before we started data collection, um, the populations that we went to collect data from, um, some of the emerging themes from the analysis that we've done so far, um, the stories from the ground based on the presentation on the subset of the emerging themes that we found. And most importantly, now that we understand what was happening on the ground, what can we do as policy makers, as implementers, as decision makers um, during this COVID pandemic? Sorry, so um, we got ethical approval to do the study in February 2021 and right um, from that point we started our pilot and data collection. We collected data, collection, um, collected data from urban setting that is in Nairobi, capital city of Kenya, and also from the rural county, which is Migori in Western Kenya. Um, we did pre-tests of the tool before we actually started data collection. And um, we did the interviews, all of them face-to-face, -face, observing COVID-19 precautions. And the whole idea is to present the findings to yourselves in this webinar and to some of our policymakers and the civil society organizations. So on the screen are some of the, are the respondents that we actually mobilized. 
um, community health volunteers for us to be able to understand how health service provision was for them during the COVID pandemic. And um, to the adolescent girls who are in and out of school, again, to understand how school closures and any of the other preventive measures affected them um, during this COVID period. And um, women in the mining sector, domestic workers as well, um, female owners of micro, small and medium sized enterprises, pregnant and new mothers, and those are the ones who are pregnant during the COVID period. COVID was um, announced in Kenya in March. So those ones who are pregnant around that time until the data collection time or give birth around December 2020. And policymakers as well, which are some of the interviews that are ongoing. So from the analysis that we've had so far, these are some of the emerging themes. There's a lot of information on access to health services, how COVID restricted that. And these are various health services from maternal to reproductive health, immunization, access to medicines, emergency care, routine care, um, there's been a lot of conversations on the mental health and the need for psychosocial support during this COVID. There's information on that as well. Provision of health services by the um, community health volunteers. Um, access to basic necessities, food, shelter, clothing. There's been a bit that's already been spoken about. Food security during this period. So we were able to get some of the ground stories that said what the realities were for families when it came to access to those basic necessities during the pandemic. Um, the social well-being of the family unit, how was it affected overall? Um, occurrence of gender-based violence, we have um, the statistics that says for every three months we're in lockdown in this pandemic period, the, um, the events of gender-based violence seems to be rising exponentially. So we'll be able to see some of the quotes, what the respondents said about that um, during this period, pandemic period. We also analyze information on support, government support, what they were obliged to do, what they did actually provide. Did it cascade to the communities where we collected the data from? Um, access to trainings, access to financial incentives, and not just support from the government, but also from the social networks, like the um, non-governmental organizations, the community and society organizations. What kind of support was there for the populations? Um, it is a gendered study, so we were purposely looking at any shift in gender roles um, during this um, pandemic period, as well as economic security. Um, luckily, we were able to do some of the interviews just when the vaccines were being rolled out in Kenya, so um, the data set contains that information as well. And most importantly, COVID messaging as well. There's a lot of information that was out there from the government, from the various sectors, and um, were the community members satisfied with it? And did they feel like they were provided with enough information to be able to plan themselves better now that we're still in this pandemic period? Um, there's clearly a lot of information, but what I'm going to focus on really today was the effect, is the effect of COVID and the effect COVID had on the family unit. Um, a lot of these other emerging themes will be covered, but my focus is on the family unit. And later on, I'll present on now that we understand what the realities are for those um, families, how could the government have done different in terms of operational plans, in terms of giving them the support? Um, what is it that was done well? What could be done better? Even as you're talking about um, rolling out gender responsive plans. So over to the preliminary findings. We should have the final data set in about um, a month or so. So I'd like us to think of this family. Um, the typical families would have about two adolescents per household, a mother and father as well. COVID Families basically had a double blow during this COVID period. First, there was a pandemic, the health effects of it. And then the preventive measures, the containment measures and the policies had a ripple effect. And some of these ripple effects is, for example, the gender-based violence, which is called the shadow pandemic, but it's not a shadow pandemic anymore. Lives were actually affected. And I can actually call it a dual pandemic during this period. So there was COVID and then there was all these other issues, societal issues, family issues that were coming up. Um, there was, con there was um, lockdowns, there was a time where there was social distance and being curfew being implemented. And a lot of the people as part of their coping mechanisms, what the community members are saying was they had to reach out to their colleagues at the time when offices were still open, but eventually they were closed. So they could only reach out to their neighbors, their spiritual leaders for psychosocial and financial support. 
um, there was a period in Kenya where areas were zoned off and essentially what that did was to, to disrupt social networks. Family members were separated by some of these um, preventive measures and what they were saying was they felt abandoned there were some people were saying that they felt ab abandoned they felt alone and there are issues to do with financial support as well where they try and seek and um, from their distant relatives another thing that came to be um, was at the onset of the pandemic there were job losses what this job loss has meant was people were now locked in couples were locked in in the house there was a lot of tension there was a decrease in the household employment income. And the effect of that was people had actually to ration the amount of meals that they're having. So you'd have families saying, whereas before COVID, they would have four comfortable meals. Now they were even lucky if they could afford one. Food was all of a sudden not available for them. And yet we expect this to be um, societies where they are thriving during this pandemic. But the reality on the ground was that they could not be able to afford the basic necessities, rent for some of the people who are living in the informal settlements were suddenly unavailable. People who are being thrown out by admission from the, some of the scripts, they were not able to access you know, the food, shelter and clothing. And, and a lot of them actually used up their savings. So what was happening in that social space was, whereas they were the people who their elderly relatives would depend on them, all of a sudden they could not also be able to meet the needs of their extended family. So they could not meet the needs of the nuclear family in terms of food, shelter, clothing. That reduced drastically because people were, either there wasn't enough money or the one for the amount of savings that were there, they were very careful with how they use their savings because they were not sure how long the pandemic period was going to last. So whereas ordinarily they'd be able to send money to their elderly parents to do activities in the rural villages, they'd be able to take care of their siblings, all of a sudden they could not be able to do that. So what that brought was a lot of tension within families as well. There was a lot of food security. You can see some of the comments there was during Corona, my father lost his job. Now there was no food in the house and for that they had to survive on one day a meal. Um, during the planting season, they keep on calling you to send their money to be able to plant, yet I have no money as a person who's admitting. When you try explaining to them that COVID has affected you, they do not want to understand that. So there was a lot of issues to do with mental stress or mental distress. And um, in some instances, unfortunately, negative coping mechanisms came to be, and we look at that in the next slide. So the family unit was disrupted in every single way, and as I mentioned, that it was a double blow. There was a health effect, and then the ripple effect on the family. And then we talk about the youth, the well-being, the children. Now, bad meetings, some of them said that because the schools were closed down and the preventive measures were there for a reason. As a government, some of these measures had to be you know, put into action. And it's not just unique in Kenya. I think globally, there was a period where schools were closed, children were at home. But now what the youth were telling is that they had too much time on their hand. They were not given an alternative. Um, they were at home. Um, their parents are at home. There's a lot of violence happening within that area. So some of their coping mechanisms was drug and alcohol abuse that was in discipline and violent behavior. Um, those who were in school, even when schools reopened, they did not go back to school because of issues to do with teenage pregnancies. Um, in Kenya, we had um, a few headline stories about increasing teenage pregnancies during this period. Um, some of the ground stories that we got to hear during the data collection was abortion was on the rise as well within the communities um, that we collected this data from. There were cases of early marriage. Um, some households, because there was a decrease in the employment income, by admitting some of the adolescent girls actually confessed that their parents would then ask them to go out there and get money. The only way they're able to do this is if they engage in sexual relations with men so that they can be able to get some money to take home, to be able to buy food, to buy some of the basic necessities that their parents could not afford. So even some of those roles that were parental and caregiver roles were shifted to the adolescents who would have otherwise been in school and earning an education. There was an increase in sex work and radicalization by gangs because according to some of the adolescents, basically they had all the free time 
and they do not know how to occupy it because they weren't given an alternative. The only other alternative that they were saying, particularly for the adolescent girls, was that now they were being made to take care of their siblings. Now they were being made to take care of the household chores, which was not something that they enjoyed, they would have rather been in school. So to avoid that work at home and paid work at home, they'd rather go out and mingle with their peers, even though there's social distancing as well, but they'd rather do that and then end up sometimes in gangs. Um, so some, again, these are some of the quotes that were there. And it's important to realize it because these are the, some of the lived realities. Um, of Anne, the sorry, um, please wrap up if you can. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I'm almost done. And then there's the issue to do with the occurrence of sexual and gender-based violence. Again, going back to the loss of jobs, there's a lot of tension in households. Now the rate of um, gender-based violence had intensified witnessing partner violence by children. And you need to understand the effect of this is the intergenerational cycle of violence where children witnessed a lot of this in the community at home. They normalize it, then they might end up being either perpetrators or survivors. So with all these lived realities, what does that mean for policymakers and particularly during pandemics. I don't believe COVID would be the only one that could happen in this you know, day and age. Unfortunately, maybe some could happen. Ebola happened, we never thought COVID would, COVID did. We need to be very careful with some of the policies that are being implemented. We need to have the social rights, social protection schemes. Now that we understand what the realities are on the ground for households in informal settlements as gender-based violence, the teenage pregnancies, what can we do in terms of provision to protect the most finally with innovative ways of doing this as well um i think that that's it in a nutshell i'm sorry valerie no problem and we lost you there for the last minute but we can catch up on your on any findings or anything we missed uh raised to sd uh, gbv uh, in the discussion coming um so finally we are going to our colleague in nigeria amy over to you Thank you, Claire. Um, hello, everyone. Oh. I'm going to wait for Rosemary to just put my slides up. She's going to help me navigate. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amy. Um, together with my team, we were responsible for um, carrying out the qualitative aspect of the research in Lagos, Nigeria. In Nigeria, initially, we had conceived doing it beyond Lagos, but um, obviously social distancing and everything around COVID limited that. And so we focused only on Lagos. Next slide, please. Um, some of the emerging themes that we are seeing um, are around gender roles and the use of time in the household, access to health vaccines, health services and vaccine uptake, access to information, mental health and psychosocial well-being, food security, social networks. Um, this was interesting in terms of government's response to COVID-19 and it, it, we saw two things, which is trust in government and then some, obviously some new policies or government strengthening existing policies that they already had and then coping strategies. The ones highlighted in blue are the ones that I will attempt to finish in the next 10 minutes uh, talk about, but like everyone has said, these are preliminary findings and more will still be shared. Next slide, please. Um, similar methodology with Kenya. Um, we had started conversations in October around the research, and we didn't begin the research itself until, well, we did a pilot in December while we were waiting for our IRB to be approved. It wasn't approved until March, and that was when we actually went into the field. Of course, we went through the process of pre-testing the tools, uh, um, continuously looking at how it, it, it it will elicit the information. And because at the time, the quantitative part of the research had began, we wanted to make sure that we are, we are bouncing off each other, qualitative and quantitative, to make sure we get findings that would be used appropriately um, in civil society and policymakers. Next slide, please. We looked at respondents, 70 respondents. It was a small sample survey. Um, our focus was looking at health workers, 
adolescents, women in slum communities, um, women in informal markets, and I should say women and men in informal markets. We looked at persons with disabilities, uh, with disability, and um, we are rounding up at the moment our conversations with policymakers in Lagos. Next slide, please. So what are some of the findings that we're seeing? Um, it's interesting because COVID-19 was a disruptor for many um, and, and everyone um, from Bangladesh to Kenya to Nigeria, it wasn't any different. Um, it would help to give a, a little bit of context in terms of um, when we started in Nigeria with lockdown. The first case was discovered in February and after that we went into a lockdown, not in, in specific states, especially states considered the epicenter of which Lagos was one. And so we went into lockdown, I, if correctly, went into lockdown in March, sometime towards the end of March, and we were locked down for about, so March, April, May, and I think by June, it started easing out in different phases um, across um, the state and also across uh, the, the, the nation. There were different um, policies that were observed immediately, one of which was a closure of borders, closure of the airports, um, stay home at work, enforcement of mask wearing, um, hand washing um, at, at different points. Markets were closed, schools were closed, and schools stayed closed till sometime in October. Um, and most schools went online, not all, most private schools went online and public schools continued through different methodologies um, of reaching to students. So there were different structures that were used to deal with the lockdown. Um, it was interesting because Lagos State was one of the pioneer states in terms of at the foremost of the plans for lockdown of being responsive and so there was a lot of collaboration between the public and the private sector um, to be able to deal adequately with uh, the fallout or the impact of the pandemic next slide please and so what are we what were we seeing um, as everyone has rightly um, mentioned there were um, gender divisions of labor. This is not new or unique because of the lockdown. It has always existed before time. Women were always and have always been doing the lion's share of domestic work, domestic and unpaid work. Uh, it wasn't any different during the lockdown. What was um, what what happened during the lockdown was, of course, there was an increased workload for women and girls compared to men and boys and so while there were some men who, who obviously be they, they they discovered their 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 gendered side and started doing household chores when you look at the scheme of things women's work increased disproportionately compared to men and boys um, and while men thought oh we were working more women especially married women thought now nah, they're not really working to be honest they're not doing more than than before so for instance what i want what we saw was 11 percent of married female respondents said they got support um, from their partners and this is compared to 33 percent that say of men who said oh yes we were always supporting them we're always helping them they probably and this is my opinion probably did one chore a day and went to sleep and the rest were carried out by women but that is just me there was a lot of changing in roles and women when the women have been breadwinners in some especially in some sectors in, in in nigeria but what happened especially with regards to informal work was a lot of women emerged and became breadwinners they started now actively contri contributing or much contributing much more because their husbands or male family members had lost their jobs and they, because of the uh, 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 informal market they do, were able to step in and step up. So part of the groups that we interviewed were a lot of women in informal markets, so women who, were, who sold by the roadside, who sold tomatoes, who sold, um, who made food, who cooked, and were able to, because of the use of technology, were able to 
innovate and be creative. So they started earning money because a lot of people were ordering food. A lot of people were shop were shopping. They couldn't go physically, so they had to use people. And so women were able to step up. Now, while this was good in one hand, it led to increased pressure for women. In truth, even after the lockdown, even till now, a lot of women, it, the roles haven't reversed, which is a good thing. But what it means is that women are being the breadwinners, but not accorded that um recognition for it as well so there was increased tension around livelihood and finances which could lead and did lead to um, mental health challenges across board i mean some of the quotes that came up was it changed because kids were always at home i had to wash more now their clothes were dirty and and many of the homes that we talked to they didn't have help they didn't have domestic help um, because a lot of people had to go home because of the lockdown a lot of people were 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 not able to come out movement was restricted so it was a challenge and so a lot of women who worked whether it was formally or informally had to step into those roles um, another quote here says there's always pressure if you have things to do and you're not meeting up financially it will be telling on you physically and mentally and this links to the mental health like when the lockdown eased and children had to go to school and they had to work next slide please i have to run through um, access to health services now this is interesting because what we saw was while the tertiary institutions were open um, and it, people were supposed to or were able to go, a lot of people didn't go to the hospitals. They didn't go to the hospitals because of uncertainty around the provisions of health services, especially around sexual reproductive health services. It hindered the service uptake. And so a lot of people turned to self-medication. Um, a lot of persons with disability were affected because most of the facilities that they were able to access didn't have uh, access for people with disabilities and it was interesting for us to see next slide please um there was no significant difference between vaccine uptake between men and women but then again when we did this research it was in the early part of the vaccines just coming to nigeria but what we did see was there was a lot of religious and social beliefs which influenced people's perception particularly women um there was also the um accessibility with regards to persons with disability um a person said um i had the vaccine polio vaccine when i was younger and i got polio i'm not sure i'm going to take the covid 19 vaccine and it's something for us to think about next slide please um there was food scarcity due to the lockdown because of the cost of food. But there was a lot of um, palliative given by government, by employers, by friends and family, by churches. So it, it kind of appeased it in a certain way. Still, there was still a lot of um, reduction in the quantity and the quality of food. Um, which again has significant implications for nutrition, for health for children, and for health for adolescent girls and mothers. Next slide. Government response. As I said, um, government did respond in many ways, um, but overall, every, uh, people that we spoke to felt that government response was slight, was inadequate, was slightly inadequate. There was a high level of distrust. Um, which again has significant implications for policies that are being developed or even building back better. So a lot of people felt, oh, how can you give us this amount of palliative? It wasn't enough. A lot of people felt uh, government was insincere in terms of its accountability regarding the COVID-19 palliative. And it is worrying to hear that, but it's also interesting to see government's response. Next slide, please. As I said, there were several coping strategies that were done. This was done by our colleagues in the quantitative. A lot of people sold assets, um, reduced food, uh, non-food. There were loans and savings. There were other incomes. But it, it, it wasn't significant, as you can see, for men and women. Um, and it's something to question a little bit more as we go along. Next slide. So implications, I've mentioned what they are. Initially, some of the response was gender blind, but as it, as it progressed, it, they became gender aware. The issue is in what spectrum are they aware? Is it empowering? Is it transformative? It's not there yet, but it's, it's still getting there. The implications of these findings are important because 
talking to, to the government officials, many of them have begun thinking through, for example, there's increased investment in social protection in Lagos State, and you will hear from the, uh, from, um, the uh, PAMSEC how they're doing things to build back better and to incorporate technology, especially digital technology in health with young people. So this is critical. There are still long-term impact, especially with regards to mental health. It's not something that has been looked into critically in Nigeria. And so one of the things that we hope to increase in our voice is to talk about the mental health. Uh, I'm going to stop here now, but I just want to use the opportunity to just remind you, I think Claire mentioned it to begin with, that what we're still analyzing findings. Um, we are done a Nigerian pandemic response, which will be out uh, later this, well, the month is already over. So if it's not out by now, it will be out in the first week. And I encourage all, every one of you to check on the website to look at it and to see some of the things that I've glossed over in that. Thank you very much. Sorry, it sounded rushed, but we want to give you enough time to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. Okay, so for the next part of this session, it's my pleasure to introduce our two discussants for this uh, commentary of the findings we've found so far. So to introduce them, first of all, we have Dr. Mofia Jill, who's a Deputy Program Manager at the Director General of, Directorate General of Health Services at the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare for the Government of Bangladesh. And following Dr. Mofia Jill, we'll have Dr. Ayula, who is the Permanent Secretary of Lagos State Ministry of Youth and Social Development in Nigeria. So over to you, Dr. Mofidjil. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizer uh, to arrange uh, this very much important uh, issues uh, during this COVID situation, especially uh, uh, for those who are vulnerable here uh, around the globe. So first of all, uh, I'd like to uh, again, thanks. Uh, you know that uh, uh, I uh, was, as I was working in uh, the government, so uh, I will try to focus on few policy issues and uh, the uh, responses uh, from the uh, government side during this COVID-19 situation uh, over the uh, gender issues. So the policies actually are the considered one of the main, uh, I mean, uh, stream gender issues in the development process uh, to enhance the participation of women along with men for the sustainable and equitable way in our country. We all know that uh, the UN Convention of Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against uh, the Women, we call it uh, CEDAW, was uh, ratified by the government of Bangladesh in 1984. And before that, actually, uh, in our constitution also, uh, uh, we actually uh, uh, granted the rights of women uh, to work in all professions, that is Article 10, 19, and 28. Uh, and also, if we consider uh, C uh, in our five-year plan, as well as national women development policy, uh, field social uh, safety net uh, programs. So almost all the policies and strategies we consider to provide importance uh, on the gender issues. And we try to make uh, a sense of balance. Uh, however, uh, in Bangladesh, uh, women are actually hardworking, but unfortunately, uh, yet they are lagging behind the men. Almost all uh, counts of socioeconomic indicators weighing to gender discrimination might be or some norms or uh, practices as well as due to the limitations in uh, reaching social security uh, or other services. So uh, we are trying our best uh, to actually mitigate uh, this uh, situation. Uh, thank you all the presenter, uh, those who have presented, especially from Bangladesh, Nigeria, and Kenya. And uh, there is very much clear here that few uh, discrimination is very much, uh, uh, I mean, uh, clear, uh, especially uh, if we consider about the health access, 
uh, if we consider about uh, the nutritional status, if we consider about uh, losses of job, uh, uh, mental health, child marriage, as well as lastly, uh, the very much hot cake about the vaccine update. So in almost all the, uh, I mean, area, women are lagging behind. Uh, unfortunately, I have seen that in Bangladesh, almost first dose of vaccine has received by 62% of male rather than almost 38% of female. And second dose is a more, uh, I mean, less. I mean, 64% uh, male and 36% female. So here is also uh, there a discrimination, but we tried our best uh, to engage the uh, female or women to come over the centers to receive the vaccine. Unfortunately, might be there are uh, some gaps in our social context as well as the norms. You know that uh, females or women or mothers are always I mean, uh, try to keep themselves into uh, the family to look after others. They sacrifice uh, their times for others. So this might be one of the reasons, but we have to be more uh, clear in this regard. Uh, if we consider about uh, uh, the last death of uh, uh, during uh, the, this COVID-19 in Bangladesh, this is, I mean, fortunate scenario for female or, uh, or women that uh, uh, only 28% female uh, death uh, we counted uh, rather than 71.26% male were dead. So uh, in this context, uh, I, I think uh, uh, we are in a uh, better uh, position. Uh, you know that we have a lot of social stigma uh, regarding getting uh, the education, getting the health uh, care services, even overall uh, getting the social uh, services or social safety net. So we must have to be considered uh, uh, in these issues and uh, we have to give importance in these issues to re resolve the problem. Uh, if we see about our uh, uh, this COVID-19 situation, you know our Honorable Prime Minister is very much uh, uh, I mean, uh, align uh, to uh, provide directions, all types of directions. She actually uh, provided directions uh, to uh, provide special allowance for the female. Uh, if we consider uh, the social security scheme, so uh, with the VZD, that is a vulnerable uh, group development programs, uh, we are providing allowance for the widow uh, and old age maternity allowance as well as stipend for the girls education you know uh, uh, since uh, 2010 or before uh, but uh, as i told earlier that women are more likely to lose their jobs not only lost their jobs but you know we have uh, a good number of women uh, those who are engaged in online uh, business so we also uh, I mean, have seen uh, that they lost uh, in their business sectors uh, during uh, this COVID-19 situation uh, uh, due to uh, their uh, I mean, restric uh, restriction in, in, in lockdown positions. Uh, we have a lot of semi-skilled as well as unskilled women uh, in our labor sector. Uh, so they also lost their, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, their uh, ways uh, during this lockdown situation. Uh, most of the time women face different types of risk and vulnerability. Uh, so we have seen uh, in many of the media uh, during this COVID-19 situation, uh, but uh, our government is trying uh, its best uh, to actually mitigate uh, these uh, problems. Uh, we try to focus uh, so that uh, uh, we can provide the best help uh, for the women, especially uh, the vulnerable group, uh, that is uh, uh, those who are uh, have the uh, uh, mental health uh, condition, as well as uh, those who need special uh, help in uh, health issues. Uh, so we are trying to focus uh, on, on them. 
uh, along with this, uh, we also uh, trying to provide uh, help uh, uh, those who are, uh, I mean, experiencing any types of violence. It might be, I mean, gender-based violence. We have also seen the presentation of Kenya that, uh, uh, and also Nigeria. Uh, there was uh, some uh, occurrence of gender-based violence. Uh, so um, our, uh, uh, I mean, social security uh, part is actually uh, trying their best to uh, mitigate uh, this uh, 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 this condition. Uh, finally, uh, I will uh, propose few recommendations. Uh, we need mostly uh, to implement in in not only in our country but also uh, in global. That is. Uh, equity and equality. So this might be one of the important part. Uh, secondly, empowerment. Always we, we say uh, about women empowerment and definitely engaging the men in the process of women empowerment is very much important. Uh, third is uh, social safety net uh, programs. Uh, also, we have to put more emphasis on uh, social safety net program, which will be well designed, as well as which will be comprehensive and gender integrated state based social security, uh, uh, complementary robust social services in health and education, uh, as well as there will be some uh, conductive macroeconomic policy uh, with special attention to reduce uh, uh, gender gaps and promoting social empowerment. Uh, we must have to consider the mental health is one of the important issues because in during this time, uh, many of our mothers, our uh, sisters are staying uh, themselves into uh, home. So mental health must be taken care mostly. Uh, finally, uh, I will uh, propose uh, that we have to work together, both government as well as both private sectors. So. Uh, all we together work for this, uh, I mean, uh, this unstable condition uh, to cope up all. Thank you very much. Again, uh, I, I am thanking for arranging such wonderful program. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for those very wise insights. And it's great to hear um, about the progress happening in Bangladesh. Uh, let's let go to Nigeria now. Over to you, Dr. Ola. Well, uh, thank you very much. I think I must, uh, first of all, appreciate uh, the convenience of this webinar and the quality of the quality, quantitative and qualitative research that have been done by the prevent, uh, different presenters. Well, I'm a permanent secretary of the Ministry of Youth and Social Development. And uh, prior to my de deployment here, I was with the primary care board at the forefront of COVID pandemic. So this outcome of this research has been an high opener, especially as presented by Amy. Even though one thing that has come to the fore is that quantitative findings from facility-based uh, health settings is not totally representative uh, of the situation on ground. And that is why a lot of the qualitative findings from this social research is now bringing to the fore some of the things that we missed earlier. As of now, a lot of the data is still saying there is a male preponderance in terms of the admitted cases in, uh, with COVID-19. Okay. And uh, however, we know the direct impact and the indirect impact of COVID-19 infection has a lot of uh, gender-based uh, differences, which your qualitative research has been bringing up. Women and children still remain a vulnerable group, both from the direct and indirect impact of COVID-19, especially in the lost states. The pandemic had a significant effect on both the economy, the security, and vital services in the states, although as Earlier highlighted, some of these were in the area of uh, uh, increased sexual based violence, which went up for about, about 50%. We recorded in my ministry about 50% uh, increase in uh, 
gender based on sexual and physical violence. Also, a lot of disruption in the services, essential services were also recorded, especially with uh, childhood immunization and uptake of uh, reproductive uh, 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 family planning services, which are areas women and children uh, are the major consumers of such services. The, the pandemic had taught us a lot of lessons in Lagos State. We initially relied on our success with uh, Ebola and uh, using that response to, to tackle uh, COVID-19. And our initial response started in form of a facility-based response, whereby a lot of efforts were focused on people coming to the hospital to get diagnosed for COVID. As time went by, we knew that was not suitable again, and we had to shift as a responsible government to increase community, uh, our aggressive community case search, and then uh, isolation of cases. In a situation whereby an infection that has about 60 to 70 percent of its uh, sufferers being in the mild, for having the mild form of disease, disclosure and the uh, coming to health facilities was quite uh, poor because a lot of them will have gotten the infection and will have recovered. And this tend to give a lot of um, distrust amongst the population, especially the low socioeconomic class, as if to say the COVID was not really in existence. And this also affected a lot of the policies that the government brought out. And uh, what were these policies? Number one, we had to improve in the accessibility of a lot of the population to testing. We brought it back to the community using existing community structures. And a lot of community influencers were, were, were co-opted to search for Irish groups of which women and children were. This was the lesson for us. At the end of the day, that the, the, we entered lockdown. Uh, the three previous uh, presenters, actually, Kenya and Nigeria have been able to say that number one, a lot of household resources were stretched to the limits in terms of household income. And where you have people being bonded together with there's no food, there's, a lot, there's bound to be a lot of violence. And then this also we observed in what a catastrophic event that happened in Lagos, especially the uh, NSAS protests and the u -town restlessness, which led to a lot of uh, destruction of uh, properties. And government has now been able to live up to its responsibilities by number one, improving the social safety nets to reduce this double barrier jeopardy that was uh, affecting majority of uh, women and children. Since uh, a lot of uh, people were affected, male were affected, we also know a lot of orphans and widows will be created judging from the proportional increase in a lot of um, males that died from a uh, COVID-19 infection. So that's why I said it's, it's a double barrel jeopardy and I will agree with the speaker from Kenya. What we did in Lagos was to, first of all, make sure that during that pandemic and lockdown, access to routine services was not affected. In fact, the governor of the state was a force to first of all put in place free medical treatment, irrespective of whether you have an insurance or not. A lot of primary health care services were open, ditto for the secondary health care facilities, and people were not, authorities were made to give access to women and children free of charge. Even though this was available, we still discovered that. Uh, health seeking behavior of people did not improve because of this so much uh, distrust. A lot of people prefer to stay within their communities and uh, extension services could not get to them, especially the far reaching uh, communities. So the immunization rate amongst women and children took a dip and this was observed nationwide, not only limited to Lagos State. We had to redesign and inject more funds and also redesign our outreach services to target this vulnerable group of people in our societies. Our slums 
Lagos being a metropolitan uh, city, had, this, had a few slums. But what we had discovered even before the pandemic was that we were having emerging slums and we had to characterize a lot of these places and take the services right there. We had a pillar in our emergency response that dealt with risk communication and management. And we had to deploy a lot of social media influencers, market women, leaders, to try and get that information to our women. So probably by the time we empower the women, they will be able to also put in place some of the infection prevention strategies that have been preaching. And this actually led to an increased uptake of our community sampling strategy within, a, within about two, three weeks of we changing strategy. A lot of women came out to get tested in our different communities. We established community tents. Rather than you walk into a facility, a tent was put in every local government. We have about 57 of them that you can walk to and your samples to be tested. And that's improved the, the, the number of the case finding and were able to to also treat those that were mild cases. We also quickly as a government started the home care, home-based care plan, whereby we know 60, 70% of people will not come to the isolation centers. So we quickly designed an home care pack that was taken to the local government for distribution for whoever had met the, the case definition. This were some of the few health and responses targeted towards um, low socioeconomic class and mostly the women and children within such um, uh, categories. Another thing was that we had to strengthen as a government the domestic and sexual violence uh, response uh, unit. This had been a, a, a policy of government that had been in place. But judging from the lockdown, its effect on this kind of vices, uh, a lot of uh, trainings on health workers was done. And a lot of women were able to come out and this effort improved their uh, disclosure. There was a lot of demand generation services for sexual based violence. And so people could come within the community and come up to those designated centers to actually say, this is what we are suffering, this is what has happened. And it was not just for mentoring sake. A lot of those cases who were initially stigmatized, they also had a lot of mental issues. We had to you know, put in place a, a hotline and counseling session for a lot of the victims. In addition, many agencies of government were strengthened, for example, the Women Empowerment and Poverty Alleviation Sector Ministry. So the response during the COVID-19 was not just health-based, it was multifaceted. During the pandemic, since resources were stretched and a lot of household income were exhausted, government had to make emergency food packs. Even though some of the qualitative comments from um, respondents in the research, some were not, was not quite balanced. A lot were not too satisfied with the contents of the pack. But as much as possible, this was a, a, a good palliative that had not happened before to cushion the impact of uh, COVID-19 on uh, women and uh, children, who oftentimes are the vulnerable and who bear the most of the outcome of any disaster situation. We also improved for the first time in sustainable development and employment creation for women and uh, uh, and, uh, and youths. A lot of them were trained, uh, especially when the pandemic was now uh, going down. And this was not just training, they were also empowered with a lot of um, startup capital and uh, equipments for them to have a sustainable form of living, which hopefully we know will uh, add to the household income. More so when we were observing that a lot of households have lost their, their income. Another aspect of a government response is to also know that it's not only a gender effect. There were some part of the society that had been left behind. And somebody, I'm quite glad somebody mentioned them, uh, people living with disabilities. And uh, in Lagos State, we have the Office of uh, Disability Affairs. 
which uh, had recently been strengthened to also have a master, a work plan for the OEA for people living with disability. And some of the plans we, we are currently implementing is how post-pandemic, how do we make the work space accessible and friendly to the, to the disabled person? How do we make each employer to be able to say, look, the disabled person is, uh, somebody with disability is entitled to gainful employment. And this led to the creation of the Disability Trust Fund by Mr. Governor, which is being managed by the private sector. A 500 million Naira endowment has just been established by Mr. Governor of Lagos State, strictly for people with disability affairs. And then uh, these are all the gains of uh, our response to COVID-19. As regards um, vaccination, with COVID-19, well, the data is still preliminary and I wouldn't want to make any preemptive um, assumption from such data. Of course, there are a lot of mistrust in terms of vaccine uh, uh, accessibility and uh, vaccine uh, uh, acceptance by people. But uh, it is evolving on a daily basis and uh, in Lagos states, the response in the last few weeks, we are in the second phase of the second dose, it's been quite uh, encouraging. A lot of women are involved, and this is because we have decided that some of the lessons is to use the existing structure we have in the primary health care setting to reach a lot of people who are in need of this vaccine. We've done with the initial um, health workers and those who are vulnerable, or the front care workers and the vulnerable age group. We've moved on to the next stage of people in their middle ages. And the response has been very, very uh, interesting, especially at, since a lot of them are within the primary health care settings. So the distance you commit between your home and the primary care facility is not quite long. And these are all factors that will encourage uptake of such uh, vaccines. Definitely a lot of lessons have been learned. And that is in future responses, uh, whether quantitative data is going to support it or not, we know women are most often the vulnerable group, directly or indirectly. And I think any response, any government should have been issue of plan for the fallout of a lot of these incidences, rather than being reactive. That is the gain. That is one of the vital lessons we have learned as a government. In future epidemics or pandemics, there need to be a lot of resources deployed to take care of the direct and indirect impact of uh, such epidemic or pandemic on uh, this vulnerable gender, and of course, by extension, children. So it's been an eye-opening uh, uh, period for a lot of us in government. I will be welcoming whereby the outcome of a lot of this qualitative research will be used in further strengthening the way we make uh, our policies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ayola. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, everyone, and especially thank you to our discussants um, who've joined us today and taken time out of their very busy day and important work. It's really um, interesting for us as researchers to hear directly from people working to address all of these really massive challenges. So. I just want to say thank you so much to everybody for their time and especially to our two discussants for joining us today. Thank you so, so much. Um, we do have just a few minutes left for questions. So if you, um, I think the best way because of the time limit for questions is to send them in the Q&A and chat and I can read them aloud and have um, our discussants or panelists answer them. But, and maybe I will just take a moment um, to start us off with one, one verbal question. And that would be around the challenges of doing research during a pandemic. This is such a hard time to do just about anything. Um, and this amazing team has managed to pull together some very important findings. So I wanted to start with this question and maybe I'll direct it, if you don't mind, to uh, Dr. Rabani from BRAC. If you could maybe start us and just say, say a few words about the challenges and how you've overcome them in terms of conducting this research. Yeah, so uh, I think one of the major challenge uh, is uh, not being able to do face-to-face -face survey. 
So we had to rely on phone-based uh, survey and uh, uh, there are some benefit of doing phone-based survey, but on the other hand, I think um, uh, there, there's so much you can do. I think there's a time limitation. So you have to restrict yourself to answering certain type of questions and carry out the survey over a certain length of period before you, you before the diminishing return really set in, right? So that's, that's I think, one of the major challenges. I think the other aspect of the challenge is even managing a research team. I mean, uh, uh, if any, whenever you're doing a quant kind of empirical research, it's like uh, running a small enterprise. So especially like if you're running 20, 25 um, uh, enumerators and not uh, being able to meet with them face to face, I think uh, uh, imposes additional challenge of training them properly, ensuring the quality of the data collection. And you just uh, miss, the, um, if I may say, the human connection. I think uh, the, one of the part of doing empirical research is being involved in people and doing um, doing research with uh, fellow uh, junior researchers. So I think uh, there's the second of a personal story from the researcher side as well, which I would love to highlight here. <laughs> so I'm really uh, kind of sitting with my fellow researchers at BRAC and other places and have a conversation. Thank you so much. I think that's a very, very important point. Um, we have a question here in the chat about Flamesh Warrior, and she's asking if there have been changes in decision-making dynamics within the household. Um, I wonder maybe if Anne or Amy or Salima, somebody from the quality of side might like to speak to that. Uh, how about Amy? Oh, yes. Um, are there changes in the decision-making dynamics? Yes, there has been. Um, from a qualitative point of view, we're able to see that the changes were around, I mean, some of them around education, around where, what do we do with our kids, what do we eat. Obviously, some of them that have been centered around gender lines in the past has now evolved. So is it a significant change in terms of decision-making in homes that the woman has become more of the breadwinner in terms of providing the finances and the resources? I would say, yes, it's significant because obviously um, she's paying in terms of um, resources, but in other homes where it is an equal ratio of oh, both men and women provide, it has not been that significant. I do not know if Anne has anything else to add to that. Anne, would you like to add? We've got a few minutes left, so I'm going to um, ask Anne if you wanted to answer that question, or if there's any other kind of final messages you wanted to uh, hand over, and then we'll give Salima a few minutes um, before we close this, as I'm sure other people have uh, other commitments to get on to. So, Anne, over to you. Um, thank you, Julian. Thank you for the question. Sorry if it's a bit noisy. I'm on the move already. Um, yes, we did see some changes in decision making and gender roles within the household. Um, in most of the households, by admittance, um, by the ladies who were interviewed, their husbands or their partners or their spouses were more in the formal sector. So we saw how COVID ended up um, with business of closure, the formal sector, people lost their jobs. So all of a sudden, they were no longer the breadwinners, the women were who were they in the informal sector. Um, so then that meant even the burden of um, buying the basic necessities shifted to the women, um, taking care of the household, childcare shifted to the women. That actually contributed, according to some of the scripts, contributed to gender-based violence, because I think some of the men felt slightly emasculated, like their roles had been taken away from them, leading to a lot of tension, and all of a sudden, the man being questioned, what do you need this money for? And yet, previously, it was him who was dictating how the budget should be you know, set in the household, what should be saved and what shouldn't. It led to a lot of tension, leading to gender-based violence in the household. And matters to do with childcare, 
um, as much as the women were the ones who were still going out there seeking employment and the men were at home, there was no shift in that. The woman was still supposed to come home, look after the children, look after the household, do their cooking and any other household chores. So that didn't change. But in terms of who's now bringing the meals to the table, who's paying for what, that definitely shifted during this COVID period. Over. Thanks, Anne. Um, Salima, would you like to share some some final thoughts either on this question or there's also some other questions here um, about vulnerabilities that men might have experienced? Um, and there's one here that says the, present, the presentation on the bank with Dash side um, has shown that mental health has increased. Um, and so I wonder if you might want to speak very quickly um, some of these key things. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, in terms of um, decision making, I just wanted to really quickly touch on, uh, we were actually having a really interesting conversation based on some of the quant findings on whether um, the shift in domain has impacted decision making at all because um, due to the lockdown, men are forced to stay at home and the home is usually the woman's domain. So we were actually having a couple of pretty interesting conversations around that. We're not at a state to really share any um, updates, but if we find something interesting, we'll definitely pass it along. Um, uh, in terms of men's vulnerability, yes, definitely. Um, we highlighted women primarily in this presentation, but we did try to speak to some men and uh, the quantitative obviously has more. Um, as uh, Anne was saying, and it also alludes to what Amy was saying, because men's role has been diminished, they're feeling a lot more pressure um, in terms of uh, not being able to provide, there's a lot of pressure on them. We had respondents uh, tell us that, you know, it's a man's job to provide. If he's not providing, then um, how does that, uh, I mean, how is the family supposed to survive? So there's a lot more pressure, I think, on men to fulfill this role and being unable to do so is probably um, taking a, a huge toll on them. Uh, and I think it's also important to recognize that uh, a lot of these decisions, a lot of these things that we're discussing come as a family unit, especially in Bangladesh, it comes as a family unit. Um, oftentimes it's not discreetly a woman is making a specific decision and a man is making a specific decision. There, is a, uh, there, there are conversations and discussions taking place. So a lot of what um, we're seeing reflected in the women's responses probably also hold true for men. Um, I think I'll keep it at that. Was there anything else? No, that's great. Thank you so much, Salima. Um, and I just want to take this moment to thank everybody who joined us today. It's wonderful to have so many people interested and engaged. Thank you to the panelists um, for sharing your crucial, very interesting research. Thank you to the discussants for coming and sharing your valuable time and giving us a perspective about what is being done about some of these findings. We really appreciate it. For more information, be sure to check out our Gender and COVID website. This webinar, will be, which has been recorded, will be posted there for anybody who's missed it or if you want to revisit anything. Feel free to reach out. Please consider joining the Gender and COVID Working Group. We have some very interesting discussions. And with that, I will say thank you to everyone um, for your time and your expertise here today. Have a great rest of your day or evening, um, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you. Thank you.